Okay, welcome to the Net Zero Energy Building Knowledge Series. Uh, today we are on our second webinar in the new year. This is a platform that brings industry experts to share their expertise, projects, ideas, uh, policy, new tools, and skills to grow engagements for building energy efficiency and promote net zero energy buildings in India. This initiative is supported by METRI program, that's Market Integration and Transformation for Energy Efficiency. You can know more about the program on our website, uh, metri.edsglobal.com. Myself, uh, I am Deepa. I'm an architect and a green building consultant at Environmental Design Solutions, and I shall be the session moderator today. So today, the topic of our webinar is how to tell a high performance building story. Isn't this something we all want to be really good at? As a consultant, uh, I uh, strive on a day-to-day -day basis to tell an efficient, uh, compelling, high-performance story to convince the architect and other team members. I see the architect also trying to do the same to get the client's buy-in, while the energy modeling expert on my team feels like, this is so simple, why don't we just get it? And the client finally says, these data and charts sound Greek and Latin to me. So clearly, it is one thing to know how to design a high performance uh, building, whether it's net zero or not. And it's another thing to communicate the idea in a visually compelling manner to the client and the other team members. So specifically, this is the case when using building performance simulations as part of the design process. Energy modeling is a decision-making tool, especially effective in the early design process. Using meaningful graphics will help close the communication gap between energy modelers and decision makers, as well as sell a design feature to the owner. Let's hear more about this. From our expert panel today, we have Alejandra Menchaka joining from Boston, Michael Sofford joining from New York. It's a Thursday morning, 9 a.m. for them. And then we have uh, Amarpreet Sethi joining from Seattle. And she has a really early start today at 6 a.m. I welcome all of you to the webinar. And we will first start with Alejandra's presentation. Ali is a senior associate at Thornton Tomasetti, where she co leads the sustainability practice for the Boston office. She leverages her background in mechanical engineering and building science to provide project teams with advanced sustainable design knowledge as well as energy modeling and occupant comfort expertise. Ali is a founder of Project Stasio. She holds a PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT with a focus on building technologies and is a lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. She will start the webinar talking about what and why the communication gap. Over to you, Ali. Thank you. Um, good morning, good evening, everyone. Very excited to be here uh, with uh, two of uh, my colleagues within Project Sasio. Um, today, we will start talking about how to tell your high performance story by giving you some background as to how we all got together and worked together to help other people tell their performance story and uh, share resources with you to uh, make sure you can do it as well. Ah, why do we care about these things? Well, 
the reality is that, as we all know, uh, climate change is real. Uh, we are causing it through our emissions, human-made emissions, and our profession allows us to have the great potential of helping to reduce this impact. There is uh, the solution is through part of the solution is through achieving energy savings, and a lot of that can be done through existing to thinking about good design for existing and new buildings. The reality is that in order to achieve the largest fossil fuel energy, energy reduction, the greatest impact on reducing this energy reduction is through design strategies, through smart design. Of course, energy efficiency technologies help us, heat recovery, uh, chillers with a higher coefficient of performance, and as well as renewable energy helps us as well. But really, the key part is smart design, careful design. And this relates to being, being thoughtful about solar geometry, daylighting, natural ventilation, maximizing thermal mass, and really using passive strategies to minimize the energy consumption of buildings. These metrics then lead to design decisions and identifying the right form, the right orientation, the right structural system, the right wall design, facade design for buildings. Our key um, challenge here is how to communicate those two, how to connect those two, how do we connect performance to design in the most efficient way. Um, some of you might be familiar with the 2030 challenge. This is a challenge that um, has been put out to architects uh, and engineering firms to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. This has been done by, and at this point it says today, at 70%, but in reality, we're already in today at 80%. We're striving to design buildings that are 80% more efficient than, uh, than a baseline. And the idea is that by 2030, we're gonna get to carbon neutrality. Challenge is how are we gonna do that? Studies have found that the most successful, the projects that achieve the highest energy savings with respect to others are projects that have, that involve energy modeling, modeling or energy, uh, building performance modeling to inform the design. So we know that modeling and simulation is key to achieve and to understand how to get to, these high, to this high performance. And this is really the only way we're going to be able to achieve this number. Sorry, this image is pixelated, but these are years over here and how we're going to get to 2030. Really, it's only by sticking to these 2030 goals that we're going to be able to achieve 100% uh, carbon neutrality by 2030. The current pace is not getting us there. So what can we do within our professions to do that? We would think, well, many of us are in the building performance simulation world. Many of us are architects. Many of us are engineers. We're already doing that. The reality is that we are, but we're not quite there yet. Um, most of the time we're focused right now on what is compliance modeling. So the world is now familiar with the requirements for LEED. There's many people trying to achieve LEED certification for their buildings. The reality is that the modeling typically happens really late in the design. This is the timeline of the design process and really it's only happening here. But the changes, the design changes that we were talking about have to happen through early building performance simulation. That's what we want to talk about today. The effectiveness of simulation is much higher early in the design process. And the potential cost implications of a high performance building are much lower than we think about them early from early in the design process. Now there's many challenges that we're dealing with and we'll walk you through the challenges and how we thought about a potential solution or small grain of sand to help solve these challenges and how we feel we have addressed those challenges. Many of you might be familiar with these Excel spreadsheets or these pie charts that basically give us, uh, a, just give us a, a snapshot of what our building is doing, but without really much information, if you put yourself or if you are architect yourself, looking at an Excel spreadsheet that has a lot of numbers doesn't necessarily tell me much about what my building should be doing. How can I influence the design of my building to improve its, uh, its performance? The same happens with energy, um, with energy use analysis. While we can break things down a little bit more into where is energy going, so this is a little bit more informative on the right, we still don't quite understand what, what of my building is causing each of these things. So we really need to change the paradigm in terms of when do we 
when do we start providing um, information to the design team and how do we do it? How do we communicate that? How do we tell our story from the beginning? The second challenge is this something we see every day. I'm a consultant, but I have also worked within uh, an architecture firm. Um, how many times have we been told, let's run a daylighting analysis? Let's do an energy model without really saying, well, let's, let's step back. Let's ask a question and then try to figure out what type of analysis we need. Sometimes we don't need a daylight analysis. So many times I've been told to run a daylight analysis for something that didn't really need a daylight analysis. And so asking the right questions is, or I guess the challenge in this framework, not, not asking questions or not asking the right questions and just saying, we need a daylight analysis, we need an energy model without really focusing on what is the key question we want to answer. Is really a challenge is preventing us from having the most impact when we are doing building performance simulation. The third challenge is that while we are doing simulation, sometimes we're not providing that much insight through simulation. This example is one that, that really breaks up into two, this lack of insight. One of them, this is a radiation simulation um, where we can tell that the lower floors receive less, less radiation than the top one because of this building that is shading in front, uh, that is providing shading in front. The reality is that we need a simulation to know that, probably not, it's not a surprise. And so are we really doing simulations that are giving us answers that are valuable or are we running simulations just to confirm what we already know? The other thing you might note is that this building right here is in shadows, this one is not, and the colors are the same. The reality is if you look at the legend, the legend is completely different, right? Um, we're not necessarily providing much insight to the architect or to the design team if we're doing this. Um, and so how do, we, how do we think about that? How do we provide more insight through our simulation? The reality is we're already running the simulation, so can we be more insightful into it? Fourth challenge, there is a huge communication gap. Energy models are long and typically too confusing and intricate and into the details to provide simple information to owners and to architects. As, as someone who is an engineer by background, we like to provide details. We like to write down all of our assumptions, but sometimes we get lost in the details and we don't really step back and say, maybe just a simple graphic would summarize everything else. If they're curious about the rest, they can go into it. But but really, let's, let's try to think about what is my audience and what are they trying, what story, what is going to allow them to absorb the story in an easier way. And finally, once we come up with the right, with graphics to communicate results, oftentimes they're not very inspiring, right? Many of you might be familiar with this uh, psychrometric chart from Climate Consultant. If you've used it in the past, it's actually very useful as a consultant to understand what strategies we could be using. Is it inspiring? Does it give easy information to the reader, to a non-educated reader who perhaps doesn't know what a psychometric chart is? Probably not. And so we need to think, step back and realize that we have the information, but we need to figure out how to give it in a clear manner. And so um, this is how Project Pathio came about. And my colleague, Michael, will uh, talk to you about what we're doing with our project Pazio and what really the concept behind it is and the, the takeaways you can take. So I'm going to pass it on to you, Michael, and I'm going to mute myself. Yes, thanks, Ali. Uh, you uh, very nicely summed up all the key challenges that I'm sure a lot of the attendees who are listening in are facing uh, pretty much on a day to day basis. So we now move on to the next presentation by Michael Soffer who is the Vice President at Environmental Design Solutions, EDSL USA. Yes, it's the same name, but not the same company. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael is a building simulation specialist with over 10 years of experience. He's passionate about advancing simulation tools and its integration into early design. Currently, he's focused on the development of TAS software, in addition to research, he has completed numerous building energy models, developed new features for simulations, and has worked to validate simulation results against measured data and testing standards. 
Michael studied in the United Kingdom at the University of York and received his degree in mathematics and physics in 2005. And as Ali said, he will now talk about how graphics can cover this communication gap. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Ali and Deepa, and thanks for the introduction, Deepa. Uh, so yes, my name is uh, Michael Sorvard, uh, Vice President of EDSL USA, based in New York. Uh, we develop uh, TAS software. So uh, a few years ago, um, in 2016, I believe, um, we formed, there was a, an initiative to form a research subcommittee uh, in the ABIPSA organization focused on standardizing input outputs for building simulation. Uh, the group was formed, um, has since grown, and after much deliberation over the first few months, um, as Ali alluded to earlier, the underlying issue we picked out on, instead of standardizing the inputs and outputs, the format of those, was that it was just a communication problem, and uh, how best to communicate the inputs and outputs used in building simulation. Um, this led to what is now Project Starcio, this uh, website that's on the screen. Um, with the need to, for input from the building simulation community at large, it was agreed that the best way to facilitate this was through a crowdsourced platform, uh, which allows contributors to share graphics and case studies, um, feedback and comment on each other's graphics and so on, so people to be inspired and learn about what's uh, possible, what questions you could ask, and um, what's out there. Uh, so this is part of the solution to being able to tell your high performance building story. Um, and as I said, the, the team has grown over the years um, to now 10 members with backgrounds from researchers, academics, architects, high performance building designers, engineers, and software developers. Um, so we started from a place um, of taking on board multiple perspectives and the team has grown to allow even more perspectives on just so that we, we were trying to capture a microcosm of the community. Uh, and then when we built the crowdsourcing platform that we would be able to get feedback from the large community uh, after that. So the focus of Project Starcio to make the biggest impact is obviously going to be in a schematic design. There is um, a, a great alignment with um, ASHRAE 209, which is an energy simulation design guide, um, which outlines a series of cycles on how and when to integrate building performance uh, simulation. The um, the guide outlines three initial cycles shown here is uh, the simple box modeling, conceptual model, and the load reduction analysis, and the form part of schematic design. And this was the focus that we intended for Starcio to begin with, was to collect graphics and case studies pertaining to this early phase so that the resource can make the biggest impact in the community towards things like the uh, AIA 2030 goal. Another part of um, aligning Starcio with the industry um, was to make sure that it was listening to the architectural side of the community instead of just the uh, engineering side. And so it also aligns well with the Architects Guide to Building Performance, which basically outlines how to integrate performance simulation into the design process. Here's just a graphic from that guide uh, that's overviewing single aspect and whole building simulation of different types, some of which may be performed by architects, others by building performance simulation professionals. And all of this was in, is the idea behind it is that all of these types of analysis could be part of the uh, Project Starcio resource so that uh, people can go there for inspiration. Once a graphic or case study is uploaded to the Starcio website, graphics from these types of analysis, uh, particularly the first three cycles of ASHRAE 209, and even more particularly the load cycle reduction part, which is the only mandatory cycle in that standard uh, to comply with it. Um, those things, once uploaded, can be filtered and searched through the website. So you can either pick categories of types of things like the cycles themselves, platforms that were used, how to do it, um, natural ventilation or airflow uh, case studies and uh, graphics, just so you can get to the, the thing you're thinking about doing yourself in your project quickly through the, re the resource. The, uh, the great piece that Project Starcio adds um, into those two resources I mentioned earlier is that 
it can help inspire or provide examples to how to communicate the simulation that was performed, an element that perhaps is missing from those other two, uh, two standards. Um, and a, a strong, another point, point around of Stasio, instead of just the graphics side, is this questions menu idea that every graphic submitted to the website has to have the form of uh, what is the impact of an input or strategy on an output or metric. This is such that you can we can categorize these questions into groups such as like all the ones that pertain to natural ventilation. People could then search for questions they could ask if considering natural ventilation on their project. Uh, and then that question links to the graphic that um, answers that question. So it's a, a way to find inspiration for things to ask about your design and also how best to communicate those questions once you've got to your uh, result. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is uh, an example, uh, the winner from the 2018 competition uh, and its associated question. This graphic was particularly clever as the longer you look at it, uh, the information presented, the more insightful it becomes. Um, this was is just one example. Uh, there are other examples on Project Stasi intended to be as impactful as the graphic uh, shown, uh, but communicating perhaps less information in a much shorter amount of time so that when you're in front of a client and you have to communicate that one idea instead of the larger energy modeling report, that you get that idea across. Like the, the question asked was this, and this is the, the graphic to answer that response. So Project Stasio does allow people to upload graphics or case studies. Uh, the difference between those are graphics are just like the example I showed previously and this one on screen now, where there is a graphic response to a question and uh, which outlines the inputs and outputs that are uh, aligned with that question. Um, this can be thought of as basically one element of a dinner table setting. Uh, a particular dietary requirement of your building simulation performance modeling uh, is met by this one particular graphic. Whereas when you look at the large picture of case studies, they allow you to submit multiple graphics, each one answering their own particular question and answer um, to fit in with the overall uh, setting, the whole dinner setting, if you will. And then the power of a case study really is the ability to then, during the submission process, uploading each of these individual graphics, answering their own question, is to link them with a the narrative and the story through the process of designing that project. Um, this gives people not only the individual examples, but a thought process of designing from you know, early schematic design, perhaps to the end of schematic design for a particular project. And that really is the one of the key powerful pieces along with the questions menu and the individual examples, all the repository of graphics that um, Sasu could bring to aid on things like the 209 standard for mastery and the architect's guide uh, to building performance simulation. I think that's the end of my section. I'll now hand over to Armapreet to tie up the uh, problem statements. Thanks, Michael. Those very nice uh, examples of graphics from Project Stasio website. I hope everyone's taking note of it. It's a great resource. Now we move on to the next presentation by Amarpreet Sethi. She is a principal at TK1SC, an engineering firm, and leads the energy and sustainability team. Her background in architecture and building science and her experience working at architecture and engineering firms allows her to provide valuable contributions in the field of high performance building design holistically. She is a published author in leading journals and has been working in high performance design and sustainability arena for the last 20 years. She will talk to us about how to get the point across in practice. Over to you, Amarpri. Thank you, Deepa. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I'm the newest member of the Project Stasio team. I just joined last year. Um, and as Deepa mentioned, I've been doing building performance in the industry um, in as part of architecture and engineering teams um, and engineering teams. And I started out as an architect. And after doing a master's, I realized I, I kind of 
really enjoyed the engineering language and the focus on systems. So that's been my world. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit, show you some examples from Project Stasio for some of the graphics that we used during the design process, early design process, to help make a case for um, some of the solutions that would make more sense for the for the project. And these are, as Michael and Ali talked about, crowdsourced. So these are all on the Project Stasio website. If you're interested to find these later on, they're certainly available on the presentation, but there is a, a much larger resource that's available at the, the Project Stasio website. So I encourage you to go look at that as you're looking to get inspired um, to create graphics that can communicate um, the intent of what you're trying to show in a, your project. So perhaps you're trying to convince an owner or you're trying to convince the architect. I think that's another really important thing who your audience, important thing to keep in mind. Who is your audience, who, who you're trying to convince and what you're trying to convince them to do. So um, I'm going to use the I'm going to use the examples from the 2019 competition um, because these were these are more recent and these are ones that were also presented at the Ibipsa conference last year. Um, and there are two competitions that have been held. So if you do go to the website, you will see uh, the 2018 and 2019 competition examples. And in addition to that, there is a whole other. I mean, you can contribute to the website as well, so you don't have to wait for the competition. But it's a really good space for you to go and look at examples of what people have used as graphics to make a case for um, daylighting, for shading, for uh, different technology as well. But a lot of focus is on the early cycle of the modeling. So I'll just go into that now. So I want to start with the early simulation space. Ali had you know, talked about how it's really important to do the simulations early on and share a lot of that information early on. Otherwise, it's really using modeling to validate what you already know. But the key impact that you can have with using building simulation early on is changing the direction of the project, right? Where the project can go. So this is a really good example of an early simulation that was done to compare different massing concepts. So this is for a fire station. And as you can see, these are three different examples that were modeled to compare the massing and the orientation. And I'm pretty sure there were multiple options that were modeled, but it's really important to pick the ideas that you're going to share with the owner or share with the architect to compare, um, compare the most useful information with them. And in this particular case, uh, one of the things that we often struggle with um, has been compared, and that's the daylighting, uh, the daylighting, and what that daylighting looks like for the three different options, or how successful the daylighting is, and the energy consumption. So you can see here the energy use graphs clearly shows the difference in the heating for the different scenarios. In this particular case, um, looks like it's definitely a heating-dominated climate. Um, and then the daylighting and the daylighting it's it's really interesting here because it's been it's showing the the SDA value the percentage daylight but it's also showing you how how what areas the under daylight portion the percentage that's under daylight the percentage that's over daylight that's really important to keep in mind as well and the ones that are well daylight so this is a really good way of showing very simple numbers to compare different massing options as the team is trying to make a decision on which direction to go from a building mass standpoint and more importantly, the orientation standpoint, which can have an impact on both daylighting and the energy performance of a building. Let's go to the next one here. This is a really, really, really great graphic that's showing a ton of information. And the more information that you have to share or the more data or the more simulations that you have to share, the more important it gets for your graphic to be clear and concise because you're trying to go through a lot of data um, at one time and you probably have a very limited amount of time to share um, that information with your client, right? So, um, so it's really key to start with the question that you're trying to answer and make that clear to the owner or the architect that you're talking to. In this particular case, the, you know, it, it's trying to look at what the impact is of the window to wall ratio and the Luba material use. So you can see here, it's a really sophisticated graphic that's showing what the Luber uh, material is here with the color of the dots 
and what the actual first cost for the project is, the dollars per square foot, and also um, you know what is the total carbon emissions, carbon cost per square foot for the different scenarios, right? What is the permutation and combination between the glazing percentage, the, the cost, and also the lure material and, and the total carbon footprint? And you can see here, um, all of these variables are, are listed here, and, and you can compare the different scenarios in this simple diagram where, where you can see the, how the total carbon footprint changes based on the material used, and certainly how that's changing with the amount of glazing in the building. As the glazing goes up, you can see the total carbon footprint is going up, and also um, the cost for the project is going up. And as you go from metal to, to, to wood, you can see the total carbon footprint goes down, but the cost is going up as well. So these kind of graphics, this is a fantastic example of a simple graphic that's relaying, um, ring, relaying the result of a pretty large data set. And it's starting to answer that question that was asked, what is the impact of window to wall ratio and luva material on both the cost? And, and, and of, of the project and the carbon footprint of the project. So, so strategy number three, creating a graphic, again, to aspire knowledge and to look for relevancy. Um, in this particular project, again, it's a huge data set, and the intent of this particular graphic is to compare the different building, building forms um, and also to compare the different climate zones and how that impacts the energy use. And while it's doing that, it's also showing the energy use breakdown for the different scenarios that it's modeling. So um, as, as you're doing the building simulation, it's really important in addition to keeping in mind that it's early, it's answering a question, and, and it's also providing a lot of knowledge perhaps. It's sharing a lot of information because as you've probably noticed as you work on multiple projects and work with multiple clients, we're increasing the knowledge amongst not only our community, but also the owners who are starting to make a decision. So when you impact one project, you're, you're probably impacting more projects because it's that knowledge is staying with the person you've shared that information with and impacts their decision making for the future projects as well. Um, graphic clarity. Again, this is, um, this is the question here is, what is the impact of insulation design on condensation risk in laboratory building enclosures. Now, this is an example for an existing building where the team looked at multiple different scenarios. And you can see here, they've done a fantastic job of creating um, the, the array of information. I'm sorry, it looks like the graphic is a little harder to read perhaps, but I encourage you to go to the website where you can zoom in and, and look at all of the, the information here. So, so here they've kind of, they've shown clearly where that dew point is what the four different solutions that are being compared is. One of the, one of the important things here to notice is there's, there's a really clear graphic that's showing you what the four scenarios are that are being compared to each other in terms of detail. And they've used Therm um, to model the different scenarios to show the amount of temperature, the temperature gradient between the inside and the outside and how that varies based on the U value and the, the detail that's in the project. Um, another thing to note here, as you look at the different graphics and the different information that you try to create, often you find yourselves having to use multiple tools to create these graphics because you do have the building simulation output, but then you need to take the time to relate back onto um, what, what are the real life scenarios. For, for in this example, the, the product below is different scenarios that have been modeled in term and they've been put together with the actual um, the detail, and they've all been put together in an array to compare the different options. So that taking that time is really helpful to compare a lot of information and provide the kind of detail that the owner or the architect, in this case, the architect needs to help make a certain decision uh, for that project. So, um, um, and I'll, I think if I have a moment, I will just jump into the Project Stasio website to show you um, some of the other graphics. Um, and Michael talked about a little bit about these standards. I also encourage you to look at these as they're really great examples of um, what are the different studies that you might want to consider doing as you go through a project flow. There's multiple building, building simulation studies that can be done for a project to help make decisions 
four different aspects of the project might be daylighting might be thermal bridging in this in uh, like the example that i shared earlier uh, might be just a building form um, so taking the time to do each of these and help share some of those results can really help guide the team in making the right kind of decisions um, the architect guide to building performance helps share some of that information and share the different single aspect ratio analysis that can be done to help make decisions through the design process. The ASHRAE 209 process, if you're, if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to look at that as well. That's a really great guide that helps share not only the early building simulation cycles, but also the cycles that will be helpful through the design process and through post-occupancy. And also the building performance, the IBIPSA um, website is a really great resource as you're looking to looking for inspiration, looking for where the modeling can best help the design team uh, make the right decisions through through the design process. So I'm just going to take a second. I wanted to leave a few minutes um, to share with you really quickly the website and some some examples here that I I'm really inspired by. Um, so this is the Project Stasio website, and this is where you can go into the graphics. Um, I'm hoping you can see my mouse here and the case studies. So I'm going to pull up just a few graphics and questions so you can start to see how, um, how you could perhaps use this resource. So in this particular case, this is one of my really favorite examples as I do work very often in the HVAC field as well. What is the impact of shading on the cooling load? Right. So if you, I'm going to click into this and you can see a zoomed in version of the graphic here. Um, and you can see here how that cooling load is changing with shading introduced um, to the project. So the scenario one on top, you can see how that load is varying incredibly through these different spaces, through the color colors. You can see very clearly how how much the cooling load is varying between the different spaces. And that can and that can often lead to discomfort in addition in addition to higher load and hence higher energy consumption. You can see here below with shading how that's reduced and your cooling load is a little bit more uniform through the space. So here. Um, and then again this is a, a daylighting example. What is the impact of glazing size and shape on daylighting and solar gains? I'm going to zoom in here again. You'll see that in a second. Um, you can see the two different examples where you can clearly see on on the left example, there has been a lot of um, ch change in the in the in the glazing size, and um, you can see how you can see a lot more green, right? And the green is where you want to be. You want to be well daylit. The blue starts to get darker, and of course, the black is darker. But the intent here is to remove the red, which is a lot of glare that can cause um, not only discomfort, but essentially the, the internal blinds may come down, you actually may get rid of all of the daylighting or all of the view, and you're also leading to a lot higher um, solar gain, leading to more cooling needs and airflow. So these are sort of some examples and um, the, the Project Stasio website where you can go in and start to look at some other examples. So I wanna end with that, Deepa and um, just hand it over to you for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Amarpreet. Those were uh, great examples. And, um, you know, also good uh, approach that you kind of summarized uh, very nicely. And uh, at this point, uh, yes, I'd like to tell all attendees, you please start sending the questions. We are getting some already. But do start sending it in in the chat box so we can start taking them one after the other while we are having this little chat with the panelists. Because I just want some more insight and thoughts um, on this topic. So I thought we can just maybe chat a little bit um, on this topic about your uh, experience. Um, uh, maybe I can start with uh, uh, Ali, like you, um, you know, explained all the challenges. Uh, that one would typically encounter. But at the same time, um, you know, I wanted to uh, kind of get your insight as to, uh, you know, when you do simulations, you feel every output is very important, uh, like you mentioned, because you are so deeply involved in the analysis. So you feel everything is equally important and really uh, insightful. 
But then how do you zoom out and be strategic about what data to show and what narrative to present to the, you know, whether it's the architect or the client? How, how do you do it? That's, that's a great question. Um, the way I try to see it myself is um, I imagine myself, and I'm trying to find the right analogy, but imagine myself, you know, finding, bumping into someone in the street or, or trying, to maybe having just one minute of, of a phone call, right, with someone in limited time and wanting to tell this person the entire story of my life because every single detail matters. But in reality, all I need to tell them is, you know, make sure you get home by three because otherwise something's going to happen, right? You, even though we have a lot of information for us and we love to tell details the same way we tell stories, there are some times that when we tell stories, we need to make them shorter because we need, we have limited time. The reality is all of, all of it is about limited time and limited attention span from the person who will be reading it. And so trying to think, I try to put myself in a situation where I have had someone giving me so many details in a story and all I keep thinking is, okay, is the person okay or not? Is the person alive or dead? Is the dog, did the dog make it fine or not, right? It's, it's just, sometimes you just want a shorter story even though you know there are valuable details. And so the fact that we give fewer details doesn't mean that people will, that, that the other side will feel that we are not doing enough of the work. And so the, the, the one reason why we created Sazio was because we ourselves were struggling with how do we, how do we manage to represent, to create graphics that are very easy to see. And so we like to talk about them in time, right? It's something that is a three second graphic, meaning that you look at it three seconds and you get enough information from it. You get the most relevant information from it. But then if you look at it for a minute, you get more information. And if you look at it for five minutes, you get more information. And so for the graphic you have up in the screen, for instance, the thing I like about this graphic is there's a lot of detail, right? But it's the entire daylighting simulation for an entire building, right? A very, very large building. But if I just have three seconds to look at it, I can tell that without knowing what this project is, I can tell that there is one option that is better in terms of uh, spatial data autonomy than the other three, right? And so very quickly, I can see those numbers and I see 63, 72, 50, 38. And so I know that the 72 has a higher SDA. That already is successful if that is the one metric that we were looking for, right? Then I can start looking deeper and saying, well, what is the comparison between all of those options? Or I can look at that chart that is on the left and realize that there is actually numbers and that there is um, there's, there's information per orientation for each one of the options. Uh, and I can't, it, you know uh similar to you know etc oh thank you um then i can if i were even more curious i could do more and more and more and so there's always ways to condense the information having to give quick information doesn't mean you need to cut down on the level of detail that you did it just means prioritizing you need to make sure that the i goes first to the first conclusion if you say if if this person only had three seconds to look at this and had to make a decision, what figure or metric would I highlight? And that's in this graphic, from what I read, and I did not create this graphic, um, from what I read is SDA. And then if this person wanted to know more detail about why this is valuable, then I will create another graphic that takes about a minute to understand, but that gives me more information. And so. It's about understanding layers and understanding priorities. What information is the most important in which is really just details for the person who understands more. That's a great point, the three second rule. I think I'll call it the three second rule next time when I make a graphic, I'll remember. What is it that one can take away while, you know, when you look at it, you get a graphic for three seconds. Um, I, well, I have a similar question to uh, Michael. Uh, you are so uh, closely involved with software development 
and uh, you know a software has so many capabilities and um, people who work with software they love it and they love to explore it more and more but really when it comes to getting the point across to the design team less is more so how how do you deal with that how do you um, make sure you all yeah you know you zoom out and only pick the right kind of uh, output to tell the story thank you Deepa. that's a, another very good question um so being a software developer of building simulation software uh and of it's a very capable piece of software so it means that it basically contains all the inputs you would want for you could possibly have in a software or a building simulation analysis and also potentially all the outputs you would want so there's a ton of data available um so how we tackle at trying to get to the right data um is a two twofold approach. One is making the user interface as um, approachable and easy to get from um, from visually exploring your model to um, like reviewing component by component on a HVAC diagram and seeing all the data behind it. So it just allows users to find data quickly. Uh, and by allowing users to find data quickly, they can, if they know what their model is doing, get to the right data quickly to then work out how to present it uh, and export it. And then the, the other part, um, it's a twofold approach, is obviously one, making the UI uh, give access to all the data in a very meaningful way, make it have smart links between spaces and data and um, spatial relations and also the HVAC schematic to the data. The second part being having um, basically user feedback drive quicker reports and uh, these could be very simple things like, can you tell me uh, the, the total outside air used um, in our project? For, and then if you can play a proposed a baseline, that's a quick indicator of just how much fresh air you're using and also just the potential for savings um, and also well-being like really quickly as a quick check. So there's just little reports you could do that, that quickly extract data and also allowing users to write their own custom scripts to grab uh, data out so just making it an open uh open interface um to allow people to get to the right data quickly uh, so that they can work out how to communicate that data uh, to their to their architect client to their owner client etc yep great uh that that's also a great way of looking at it and um you know connecting this to this uh, a point made during the presentation about single aspect versus whole building modeling um Amarpreet, you are an architect and now part of an engineering firm and uh, you know on the consulting side uh, when it comes to single versus whole building modeling i've observed that the eui or we also refer to this here as epi uh, the energy performance index measured in uh, you know, kilowatt hour per square meter or KBTU per square feet, this metric seems to take all the limelight and most decisions are focused around it. And, you know, it may not be the only goal to assess, right? For example, you showed that graphic where the impact of shading devices was clearly visible on the cooling loads, but there's, there's a more appreciable impact on thermal comfort and not probably of the same magnitude on energy reduction. Um, so how do you tackle with this, um, uh, you know, going away from this EUI? That's such a fantastic question, Deepa. That's a really Im important question that we struggle with every day because ev all the architects or all the, you know, the folks who do, don't do a lot of building simulation have a tendency to jump right to the EUI. What is the EUI, right? That is. That's the first thing somebody will, can you do the energy model? What is the EUI? And that's the most dangerous thing because then that means you're looking to put an EUI on the graph and that's all you're looking to do with the modeling and you're not actually trying to impact, impact your design. So it's really good, whoever you're talking to and whoever is, you know, who's sort of hired you or wants you to do the model, it's really good to sit down with them, even if it's just for 10 minutes to have a conversation to try to understand, A, where are they in the design process, right? And who is making the decisions? I think it's really important to know those two things before you do any kind of model, because then you can start to say, okay, 
clearly I understand you're in schematic design. You might even find out they're in, in design development, right? But the kind of questions you may be able to answer will change based on the stage of the design. Because the truth is, from where I sit, you can have an impact, a positive impact on the design and use building simulation uh, effectively on different pieces of the, the design at any stage, really, because the specifications may not be written in, in design development, so you can impact that. The kind of question you will help frame for your architect or for your owner will change based on where they are in the design process. Ideally, they're early on and you can have the largest impact. Secondly, who's going to make the decision? And that's going to help help you figure out what kind of questions you can perhaps talk about. What's important? What kind of building is this? Is this an office building? Is this where daylighting is going to be helpful or there's a lot of computers? Is glare the big issue? What's what, what are the different scenarios and how is the occupant going to use this building? And once you have all of that information, that's when you can start to you know put the put the questions on paper and start to talk to this person to help them understand the kind of questions you can help them answer because very often what i find is somebody who's coming to you with the eui focus right it's not that their focus is just in eui deepa i think that you kind of nail you know hit, you hit the nail on the head there they're only coming to you with that sort of question because that's the only thing they know from where they sit that doesn't mean that's the only thing they're interested in. Chances are they are interested in knowing more. They don't know what you know. And as soon as you're able to sit down with them and tell them what are the different kind of things you can help them analyze, they'll they'll work with you um, to, to present that information back to the decision maker. So that's when I, I encourage you to start to show them examples, perhaps even, to say these are the things that we can al analyze for the building that will not only help you to get to a better EUI, but help you make the kind of decisions you're probably making today. Um, so, I mean, like you're, sh you're sharing an example, I think, for adaptive thermal comfort. And that's a really great example because very often people talk about natural ventilation and they just want to know, okay, how much energy am I going to save with natural ventilation, right? But it's a really great place to stop and say, well, I can tell you how much energy you're going to save with natural ventilation. But I think the key questions we want to be asking are, what are the different strategies that you want to make sure you have in the building to make natural ventilation effective, right? Have you put in shading in the building? Um, you know, because if you're not going to have the right kind of shading, then it's it might not be very helpful to have natural ventilation because you're going to have too much solar gain and you're not really going to be able to cool the building with natural ventilation because you've overheated it with the shading. So even they, though they came to you with what's the EUI if I put in natural ventilation, the key key thing is to put in, talk about what's the shading in the building and how is that going to impact the success in natural ventilation? How is that going to impact daylighting? And perhaps the question is, do you want to make, you know, who is going to open these windows? Is there a way we can automate them? And how does that change the performance of the building if you automate the building? And then start to consider some other aspects of reducing the load to make natural ventilation more effective. And then I think that's, and then start to also talk about, um, you know, when we're talking about natural ventilation, Let's make sure we understand the potential is the person's going to be more comfortable at even higher temperatures than they otherwise would be if all the windows were closed and they were using only air conditioning. So, so the, the, the main, the answer to your question is having that conversation starts to become important and it starts to become important to show them things besides an EUI and then perhaps, like as Michael was saying, you can close, close the loop with, with the energy consumption as well. Um, and show what the true impact is on the EUI. But I think um, it's important for everyone to understand that the EUI changes pretty drastically when you change certain assumptions. And and when the window is going to be open, is the window automated or not? So making sure those assumptions are discussed because you, as a, as a person who's doing the building simulation, depending on how involved you are in the design, may not understand some of these assumptions as well as the owner or, or the designer does. So making sure you're having those conversations to, to help guide the team are really important. 
That's right. And that's absolutely the most important thing to keep the conversation going. And like you said, um, architects talk about it because it's probably the only thing they know. It's not like the only thing they care about. So it really um, you know, matters how architects get better at asking pertinent questions to the energy modeling team. So with that, I, I will jump into the Q&A. There's a lot of questions we have uh, from the audience. And while we're just pulling that up, um, uh, Alejandra, you had some announcement. Yes, um, I thought it would be opportune to mention that we are actually looking for a web developer to join our team. Uh, we're all volunteers in this project, but we're very excited and, and you know, it's a really good way to make connections with the building performance simulation community. So if any of you have um, very good experience with WordPress um, and can take a look at our website and feel comfortable with it, feel free to send us an email. Our emails are not on this page, but they were in our slides. So I assume Deepa, in some yes. ways it is possible to you can contact will, us via LinkedIn too. We will share the contact details of all the three uh, panelists Perfect. with uh, yes. attendees. So anyone who's comfortable with WordPress, very comfortable, it's a complex website, uh, but if you're good at it and want to join a great team, please send us a message. Okay, so with that, let's take the first question. Use the Starfio graphics. Can we edit them and use them as per our project specifications? So I think that it's really important. I, I would say you should use the graphic as, you can certainly use the graphic idea. So I would recommend using the graphic idea, and that's really the intent of having these graphics, is to be able to replicate the idea of how you're representing that, that question and how you're answering that question. I would encourage you to n not I mean, the intent of this this project Stasio is not to share solutions. So the actual data and the actual results, that's not the intent of project Stasio. Um, those have not been a. We've not gotten to the detail to to make sure that that you know what what assumptions we use if they're relevant for you, if the climate zone is relevant for you. So so all of those things I would you know I would recommend you do not use that for. Um, it's a fantastic way to replicate that particular graphic to communicate exactly what, what they were doing, use all, all of those questions as they're written, but that would be my recommendation. Yeah, just to add more specifically, there is no specific file sharing uh, in terms of if this were created with a script. We don't have the platform for that. We've discussed it, and what we have discovered is that most of the graphics that have been uploaded are either a simple Excel where the data doesn't necessarily, shouldn't be shared, again, because we're concerned that people will sh will use the data and the data is not there to be used. Uh, you should generate your own data. But most of the times, the graphics are actually processed through many softwares, and so it's not easy to just upload files for everything. But the answer is you can you can look at them for inspiration, but you would need to create your own. Each person who submits is required to outline the path the workflow they used and what software they used to create it. Right, I, I think that more or less answers this next question. How do we know what software we used in making these graphics? I can share my screen here if, if you like, Deepa, um, and really answer that question. Because, okay. So I'm on the website here, and um, you know this is this is the homepage. I'll show you real quickly. Um, it's taking a while to load, so I'm going to jump into the graphics. So if you click on the graphics, you have these graphics here, and this is the question. If you click on the graphic, you get a high-resolution graphic, which is really great as you as you want to read the graphic. And then if you click on the question, give it a second here. Are you seeing the graphic? You are seeing seeing my screen, right? Yes, we can see the okay. screen. Okay, great. So here, if you go into it, it gives you all of the detail with regards to what tools we used and a lot of other, you know, what is this graphic showing? How did you make the graphic? So how did you make the graphic goes into the detail of 
uh, what tools we used, and in this particular case, Excel graph and a Microsoft PowerPoint to combine it with the list of. So it gives you the detail of how the graphic was created and a lot of other information, which is really useful as you're trying to replicate the graphic in terms of what it shows, was it successful, and, and then certainly ends with what would you do differently if you had more time and fee to do that. Right, next question. Um, different software often use different parameters. How can they be combined? I guess it means how can they be con combined in like one graphic? I guess that speaks to either getting raw data out of the software or um, using graphics generated by the software itself. Um, and if you're, if it's the latter, then you are kind of, unless you can get access to the data behind each graphic, then you could do whatever you want with it. Um, it's how we usually approach things, making sure all the data is available. But if the graphics are generated by a piece of software, then really all you can do is take that into Photoshop or an Adobe project product or even paint and try and edit it to, uh, to do what you need to do to change the key for uh, the the uh, yeah the key for the the graph for example maybe the output has a very low res or small uh, key indicating the scale for whatever's being displayed and you want to change that so it's it can be tricky but then people have cha tackled those problems with these uh, uploads uh, to Starcio and hopefully in the the process of outlining how they created them there'll be some little tips and tricks on how to overcome certain problems with getting outputs from multiple software into one report, making it look seamless. Also, maybe the case studies can help with that too. Right. Uh, next question, how, how do you create these kind of graphics? Do you have different uh, people on your team with different capabilities or they all do energy modeling? We have had that question before. I'll definitely let other people add to it. Um, We've had the, like, do we have to hire a graphic designer on our team to, to be able to provide graphics like this? And some of the examples are just using Excel efficiently and effectively. So I don't think you need to have a graphic designer or access to that type of tool to provide polished graphics. It can help, but it's not required. I'll pass on to the other people. <laughs> I think the one thing I'd add to that is I, it, it's such a valid question and, and I have to admit it, it, is, it does take time to create these graphics and there's not always the time um, and fee to do that. Uh, but what's really great is once you've created one, it can start to become a template and can be super helpful. And, um, and I've noticed that every time I am taking the time to create a graphic, a, a graphic and I'm usually doing it in PowerPoint or with an Excel as Michael was saying, I find that it helps me think clearer about my simulation as well and perhaps changes um, the way I communicate the message even technically. Right, and uh, just uh, one final uh, question before we wrap up. Uh, from, from each one of you, from your experience, how can architects get better at asking Pertinent questions to the energy modeling team. Do you have any, you know, tips to share? Yeah. So what I have started doing is, um, and again, I have been both on the architect side. I worked for an architect before, so I was the one responsible for talking to the consultants, and now I'm the consultant. Um, and the I would say step one: start doing it today. Whenever you are discussing running a simulation, even if it's the simplest energy model where you're trying to change three different insulation types on the wall or two different window types, things that you've done every day or a daylighting simulation, make sure you email the person who asked you the simulation. So say if you're a consultant, you email the architect or you talk to the architect and say, just to be clear, what we're trying to do is answering the following question. And Stasio, we, we came up with a format that has worked for us uh, that uh, Michael introduced, which is what is the impact of, and then you put the design strategy. So for instance, what is the impact of window selection or what is the impact of massing or what is the impact of 
wall insulation, and then on, and then a specific metric. So energy use, peak load, et cetera. And that very clearly sets out and outlines what your answer should be. So as you're trying to convey your results and you're trying to think about your three second metric, right? What is the one result that you will put in your graphic that stands out? It's the one result that answers that question. So what is the impact of additional insulation on my energy use? You should have a graphic that clearly outlines insulation and energy use. The fact that you did many other things is important too, but it should not be prioritized in the graphic. It also allows you to, to think about why you're doing a simulation. Sometimes someone will ask you, run a daylighting simulation, and once you ask them, why am I running it? They'll say, well, to calculate my energy savings. And we all know, and daylighting simulation will not give me energy savings from daylighting. And so that very clearly will allow you to step back and say, wait, so, if the, the question is, what is the impact of daylighting on energy saving? Then maybe can I suggest running, you know, an energy simulation with a certain reduction for lighting load or running a specific daylighting simulation that will quantify that. So asking the question and making sure that everyone exercises, it makes the exercise of, of clarifying the question. You should also do this with your team. If you're a consultant and you have modelers, you need to make sure you tell them not just run an energy model, but this is the question we're trying to answer so that when they do the analysis, they understand what is the main thing that they're trying to answer. Asking the right question. It's a simple line, but it's very important. Great. Those were some really nice pointers, I'm sure. Everyone's taking uh, notes from there, whether, I mean, it, it even applies to other team members uh, as well. And uh, with that, we've come to the end of today's webinar. Uh, I thank each one of you so much for uh, your time and for sharing your expertise. And I'm sure everyone has benefited a lot from today's session. And before we uh, wrap up the session for the day, I have some announcements to make then we're going to have our next webinar on designing for outdoor comfort. That's a very interesting thing. You know, comfort and outdoors not necessarily go together, but it's a, um, a lot of insightful things to learn about in this topic as well. That will be on 12th Feb at 4 p.m. And uh, if you don't already know, we have all the webinar recordings available on our YouTube channel, NZEP India. So you can go back and watch any of the previous 21 webinars that we've conducted in the past. Subscribe to our monthly newsletter, the NZEP Times, for all the initiatives that we are doing to promote uh, NZEPs in India and to grow engagements for uh, NZEPs. And you can be a part of this as well. Join the NZEB Alliance if you've already not done it. You can sign up on the website nzeb.in and connect with us on social media. Alliance is a network of people interested in promoting and implementing net zero energy buildings in India, and you want to be one of them. And uh, finally, uh, we have a little announcement. If uh, communicating building energy efficiency is something that excites you through uh, you know graphics and words then the Matri team uh, needs such an individual uh, join us as a communications expert you can apply at careers at etsglobal.com and with that we've come to the end of today's webinar uh, if you have any questions you can write to us at nzeb at edsglobal.com i thank you so much for your patience time, interest, and attention. Have a good evening, and all my panelists have a good day ahead. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.